I'm going to start this week's show with an appeal for information. If you know anyone who has in the past worked for special forces in the military, then please run this one past them. I have been given information about a small secret group which operated or operates from the MOD St Athens military base in South Wales. The group is called Group 58 Security. The function of the group is to be on standby 24 hours a day. They have access to military jets and can be dispatched to any location in the UK at very short notice. Their function is to find and secure. That is, when activities in certain areas are reported of a particular nature, the group is dispatched to that zone in a helicopter and their task is to find particular evidence and then seal off the area. Once this is achieved, American forces, including scientists, are brought in to deal with and remove the evidence. This group was operating in the UK in the 1980s and up to at least the mid-1990s and may still be operating today. The group was not part of the British military, it was part of NATO. We are trying to locate and get information about anyone who has worked in such a group. If you have any information or know anyone that might have information, please contact me via richplanet.net in total confidence. Not only uh, was it seen, uh, the military were told to, uh, to basically shoot it down and they actually fired over 2,000 shells uh, in a period of about 45 minutes at this object. Watchers on the rooftop of the Columbia Broadcasting Building ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Searchlights closely followed the object down the coast and kept it centered in their glare. Shells frequently could be seen bursting near the object, but none appeared to hit it. The shooting stopped about 3.30 a.m. Approximately 20 minutes after the firing died down, the ship returned and headed westward from Long Beach toward Santa Monica. The guns went into action again, hurling round after round of shells at the object. The second barrage appeared to be closer to downtown Los Angeles, since watchers could hear the concussion of the guns more clearly and the flash of bursting shells was brighter. Then the ship disappeared for the second time over the ocean. It's gone down as the biggest mass sighting in history. Yes. And um, one interesting quote I read from one of the people who actually witnessed it, they said, it was a lovely pale orange uh, about the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. So we've had that reported in other UFO mm. cases. Uh, a gold and, and, and a silver and they came towards me, and when they were quite a, quite a reasonable distance from me, they peeled off to my port side uh, at great speed. It must have been a, a, a very, very closing speed. And uh, and uh, and then I turned my head again, and there was a, a, another one coming towards me, but much closer uh, in silver, with a, a bun on top and a bun underneath it. No sign of lights or anything like that. And uh, I suppose it filled half half my windscreen, shall we say? Difficult to judge that. And uh, and then when it got to that distance from me, it peeled off the right, to, you know, to my port rather. It's right, mm -hmm. and and um, which and of course at this stage I was quite dazed, and uh, um, uh, turned to follow it, and I couldn't. It was gone, and then, and then uh, 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 the next thing I did after I'd sort of got over the, the, the not the bewilderment, but a bit of a shock of it all, uh, um, I called the tower at North Wheels and reported the incident. It's Richard speaking now. I just want to ask you, um, w where do you think these objects came from, and who who do you think they belong to? Well, I'm jolly sure they don't belong to this earth. I'm now an old man. And it's still quite vivid in my mind, although it's rather difficult to record everything. But before you go, right. I'd like to say this. Whichever government, whenever, are very short-sighted about the services. Uh, I mean, cutting them down on one thing and the other, it's, it's, it's wrong. <clears throat> USAF base in Suffolk called Lake and Heath, who uh, had this object on radar, which was obviously confirmed by one of the early warning radar stations called Neatishead, which is in Norfolk, and, uh, and they scrambled 
two RAF Venom fighters from RAF Waterbeach in Cambridgeshire to intercept, just like the Milton Corris case. Very similar. Just a year before. But he certainly got a, a radar lock on, and he took some footage on his, what they call a gun camera. Uh, and this was shown, actually, to a Nick Pope predecessor, a fellow called Ralph Noyes, who was on the UFO desk when it was called DS-8, I think. In 1970, he was shown a secret briefing of various UFO footage, including this footage taken by right. Flight of Tenant, or it might have been a flying officer, Davies, uh, in 1956, in August 56. Do you know if that footage has been released, David? Or? Ooh, I shouldn't think so. <laughs> well, what, he, what did the radar report say? Well, he, he had it in, fr in front of him. He was chasing behind the UFO, obviously, at some point. Next thing, it disappears off his cockpit radar, and the air traffic control and the radar people, whether that was Neatie said or Lake and Heath, said, oh, it's behind you. And he said, oh, no, it wasn't. He said, oh, yes, it is, you know, a pantomime thing. And some, in a blink of an eye, the object had gone behind his jet and was trailing behind him. Um, each missile uh, contained around 33 times the explosive power of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, and each missile contained three of those warheads. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people that were trained to proceed with the launch procedures, etc., were psychologically screened first. They weren't people that were uh, subject to any flights of fancy. At the time, they were in a, a, a bunker 60 feet uh, below the ground on duty. Uh, basically protecting the United States from any sort of foreign attack from the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, they, they received a call from the guardhouse uh, in the capsule area where they were 60 feet underground uh, that there had been strange lights actually seen hovering over the main gate. Mm -hmm. uh, then they received a second call from a very alarmed uh, senior guards officer saying that uh, he had seen some sort of craft hovering above the gate mm -hmm. uh, and beaming a light onto different parts of the base. All control over the missiles was lost. Mm -hmm. My weapons started going down uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> we lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. Uh, within minutes of having received that second phone call of a UFO hovering outside the front gate. Is that a UFO was seen near the missile silos and the missiles were deactivated. And he stated that it definitely was not a power outage. Yes. That something had sent a signal to those missiles to yes. disable them. Uh, there was a second base where a further eight missiles okay. uh, were shut down. Mm -hmm. And after a lengthy investigation, uh, they, they just they couldn't find what, what actually shut these things okay. down. There are many, many cases of nuclear um, missile launch facilities having been interfered with by UFOs. American Air Force bases, which have had similar incidents, are um, South Dakota in 1966 and 92, Wyoming, Walker Air Force Base, and we mentioned Reynoldsham Forest. One of the most thoroughly investigated cases in Dr. Haynes' file involves the near collision of a UFO with a United States Army helicopter piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Coyne and his crew. While flying over Mansfield, Ohio, at 11 p.m. on October 18, 1973, they observed a bright red object which paralleled their craft and then rapidly moved toward them on a collision course. I looked out the window and observed this light moving at a very excessive speed, in excess of 600 knots. Coming at the helicopter, it looked like a locked-on missile. A family of five in a car observed the strange red object on a collision course with Colonel Coyne's helicopter. They pulled off the road to watch. The thing that makes this particular evening a unique experience was that it was almost a mid-air collision with an object that we, or you know, as a UFO. We did not know it was such until it was on top of the helicopter, and that took just a matter of minutes. Colonel Coyne put the helicopter into a dive to try to avoid impact. When he and his crew looked up, the object was keeping pace with them. While I was in this position, uh, the green light came out from the undercarriage of the UFO. Colonel Coyne cut the power 
and set the controls for a steep dive. In spite of this, the helicopter was pulled upward toward the UFO from an altitude of 1,700 feet to an altitude of above 3,700 feet. Colonel Coyne and his crew observed the strange UFO at close range. The object that I viewed that particular evening uh, had a high degree of technology. It was composed of a structure and a design that we do not have. The object can move through the atmosphere without causing any turbulence. It can move at high speeds, below 10,000 feet. There are no vertical or horizontal stabilizers, no landing gear, no source of propulsion reflected on the craft. It looks like it, it, it could go to fly in space. It seems like a very convincing case, yet another very reliable, highly credible witness. Well, I said there was also five civilians on the ground watching mm -hmm. them from the car, so it, it, you've got the air traffic control, the radar, You've got the capsule. Plus, plus the magnetic compass on the aircraft yeah. was affected and it never worked properly again after yeah. that. They were filming the test flight and a small UFO, I don't know how big, maybe, maybe six feet, something like that, actually appears next to Concorde when they're testing it. Now, if you just think of how fast that plane's going, it's going over a thousand miles an hour. So when you see this clip that I'm going to show you of a UFO next to Concorde, you need to bear in mind, the plane's going over a thousand miles an hour, so the UFO's got to be going even faster than that. You watch very carefully. See it? So the plane's going a th over a thousand miles an hour. And then it disappears into the distance. Watch, goes down, up. So it hasn't harmed the plane, just flew alongside it. Now if you think what I've said about the nuclear nuclear uh, weapons, the UFOs seem to crop up there and a lot of people say that when they were testing the first nuclear weapons th that's when they called them Foo Fighters and they would, they would zip in and zip out as they were doing these tests and then we've got the astronauts one of whom says the UFOs followed them to the moon so they're following Concord so what, can anyone think what's in common with all of these things that, they're, that the UFOs appear near? Anyone got any thoughts? All of them are a leap in technology. They're all technology. They're all new technology. Uh, he's basically in late December of 1980, over three nights between the 25th and 26th is the first night, 26th into the 27th is the second night, and the 27th into the 28th is the third night. UFOs in various guises and shapes came back to the RAF Bentwaters and Woodbridge base, effectively I think to surveil it uh, and in particular uh, there were incidents where uh, a Lieutenant Colonel who was the Deputy Base Commander of the base went out with a team of men uh, following an object, a red glowing object through the trees uh, of a forest which is called Rendlesham Forest, hence the title that we're now mm -hmm. familiar with, um, where they saw at close quarter, a UFO that then divided into five pieces, that more UFOs were seen on the horizon, that then began to move towards them. One stopped above a group of airmen, including the, the deputy base commander. Charles shone, Holt. This object from about 1,000 to 2,000 feet stopped above them, shone a, a, what looked like a laser beam down at their feet. He didn't know whether it was uh, to be a communication or whether it to be frightened, it, mm -hmm. they were all in awe. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, on that particular night, which is the third night, Holt's encounter is the third night, uh, beams were shone down from a UFO into the weapon storage area, and he has gone on record saying that that has gone into a weapon storage area. Now, I know, and it won't ever be officially said by Holt, but I know from having worked in my time as a Royal Air Force police officer, between 1983 and 1989, I served on two identical uh, nuclear 
uh, storage areas, and that was beam shone in down into a nuclear weapon storage. And, and, and I believe one of the, if not the largest storage of nuclear weapons in Europe at that time. And that's, that's the rumour. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have that off the record, uh, but uh, I believe that was probably why UFOs came there. The Soviet Union was in its final throes of power, and uh, the uh, Polish Solidarność movement led by Lech Wałęsa was rocking the boat in Poland and at the time of uh, Rendlesham there were literally hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops massing on the borders of Poland. Yeah. So the world was in a very dangerous place and when I look back now as to why UFOs would go to that base it maybe was because there were nuclear weapons there that shouldn't have been there yeah. and that they were probably in breach of all the uh, arms treaties of the day. Well, maybe, maybe we're like children playing with matches. Uh, this particular article, which was on the BBC website about Rendlesham, and it appeared a few months ago, and it's written by the famous ufologist Evan Davis of the BBC. Well, and, and, and you know, just to come out with some statements of this article, um, he took me to the place where the airmen reported seeing flashing lights in the sky. There, we were greeted by the site of the Orford Ness Lighthouse a few miles away. So this article is trying to make out that all of these 50 to 60 airmen had, were, were, over three nights were seeing a lighthouse. First and foremost, uh, I've never heard him raise his uh, voice as a UFO uh, commentator before. So Evan, that's a Evan Davis. Evan yeah. Davis, he's well known uh, and probably very good at what he does uh, in his day job as it were. But uh, certainly within the UFO community, I've never heard him speak on the UFOs before, which is slightly bizarre. And for somebody who is well known and uh, who is presumably an investigative journalist, he has lent himself to a very poor piece of journalism for the simple reason is that he hasn't checked out the facts with the actual people who were there. It's very easy to uh, make assertions, but you have to rely on the testimony. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, what makes this case so good Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, better than Roswell, mm -hmm. is because these are all military trained police officers. You know, they're, 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 they're working with nuclear weapons day in, day out. Now, that uh, testimony should not be ignored, especially when it's corroborated by when he went out, he went out with a team of four other people, three of which have gone on the record, one yep. of which doesn't want to go on the record, and who knows why, but the three that have gone on the record all confirm in slightly uh, different ways, because it's different perspectives, but there were clear UFOs seen at close quarter. So we are talking about a major UFO event, and yep. for a journalist of his renown in a different sphere of work to cast aspersions as to their credibility, i.e. the likes of Holt and his men, is a total disgrace yes. in my opinion. Right, we're going to go for a short break, Gary. So I think um, before we go, um, I'll just get rid of this piece of BBC uh, disinformation. Okay, join us after the break. <laughs> 